Okay, this is a new talk on a philosophical subject which may seem slightly abstract, but I'm trying to deal with what has struck me for a long time as relic idealism in the way many Marxists talk about philosophical topics. I'm going to be looking at the way people define subjectivism how it was historically generated. I'm going to give evidence for this historical account. and the end, I'm going to give criticisms of the acceptance of some elements of subjectivism by philosophers, including Althusser. Now, what do Marxists mean by subjectivism? Well, let's turn to an authoritative Marxist source, the great Soviet encyclopedia which defines it as a worldview that ignores the objective approach to reality and denies the existence of objective laws of nature and society. Subjectivism is one of the main epistemological sources of idealism. In essence, it grants primacy to the role played by the subject in various spheres of activity and the cognitive process above all. Well, at a first blush, this is OK, it's fine. It then goes on to say, subjectivism has been expounded by philosophers like Berkeley, Hume and Fichte. Uh, the philosophy of Kant is also marked by subjectivist concepts. The bourgeois philosophy of the 19th and 20th century. Um, subjectivism has been a bas basic principle of such idealist schools as Neo-Kantianism, Empiric Criticism, Philosophy of Life, Pragmatism, Neopositivism and Existentialism. Various distortions of Marxism have their foundations in subjectivism, right-wing revisionism, proceeding from a subjective understanding of practice, eclectically attempts to combine the principles of Marxist philosophy with the subjectivist philosophical concepts, such as existentialism and pragmatism. Well, again, that's great. But then it says, accordingly, Marxists... Uh, philosophy which rejects subjectivism, the subject's active role in practical life and in the cognitive process presupposes the existence of a dialectical relationship between subject and object, as well as the existence of an objective reality that has its own laws as an independent of consciousness. Now I'm going to argue this is arguably a considerable dilution of the historic hostility of Marxism to subjectivism, and it is itself making concessions. Why do I say that? Well, look at the passage. The subject's active role in practical life and in the cognitive process presupposes a dialectical relationship between subject and object. Basically, because the highlighted passage there uncritically accepts the categories of bourgeois idealist philosophy, like subject and object. These are categories derived from idealist philosophy, specifically German idealism of the 19th century. It represents a partial retreat to what Marx and Engels called the German ideology, the philosophical system developed by the German bourgeoisie in the early 19th century. And relics of this philosophical system keep occurring in Marxist literature. This involves, take this system, the German ideology, involved taking the legal superstructure and suggesting that the categories of bourgeois law were the fundamental categories of existence. That is what the the German ideology of the time when Marx criticised it and Engels criticised it. That's what it was doing. It was taking superstructural concepts and making them the foundation of reality. Early 19th century German bourgeois law assumed the existence of legal subjects and legal objects. The philosophers then abstracted these legal supports of bourgeois individualism as unquestioned premises in their whole philosophical system. Now, in their critique of the German ideology, 
Marx and Engels never stooped to using its categories. You can go through the German ideology and you'll find nowhere do they mention subject and object. Far less do they mention a dialectical relationship between subject and object. They use a completely different approach. Their, they, their premise is materialism. Since we are dealing with Germans who are devoid of premises, we must begin by stating that the first premise of all human existence, and therefore of all history, the premise namely that man must, men must be in a position to live in order to be able to make history. But life involves, before everything else, eating and drinking, a habitation, clothing and many other things. The first historical act is thus the production of the means to satisfy these needs, the production of material life itself. And indeed, this is a historical act, a fundamental condition of all history, which today, as thousands of years ago, must daily and hourly be fulfilled, merely in order to sustain human life. So, a completely different approach to philosophy in Marx and Engels. Production comes first. First is the production of human life. The production of food, clothing and housing. From this arise production relations, a division of labour and commodity exchange. You then get an ideological reflection of these relations of production, including law. So you get categories of law, like the legal subject, or the rechts subject, and the object of private property. The philosophers then took these categories of bourgeois law, these categories which were themselves just a reflection of the production relations, and turned them into eternal philosophical categories. So that bourgeois social relations became eternalised in the categories of the, the philosophers. So that you have a philosophical subject as a parallel to or derivative of the legal subject that is created by bourgeois law. Now all these categories have a historical character. Production relations change. And with the change in the production relations comes a change in the legal superstructure. And that results in changes in what are the unquestioned premises of the philosophers, since the philosophers cannot get beyond what they can see in, in the legal social relations of their time. Now, I'm going to provide evidence for this change by using data that you can all verify using Google Ngram search. The Google Ngram search facility enables you to search for phrases, that is to say, Ngrams, in millions of books. It's reckoned that since the invention of printing, about 130 million different titles have been printed. And Google reckon they've got around a quarter or maybe a bit more than a quarter of those titles digitized now. So you get a very good, large statistical sample of all books ever printed. And you can search for the usage of words and how the usage of words changed over time. And you can get a pre precise indication of how any word used to be used in written languages at any point since the invention of the printing press. And we can see using this that the modern category subject is a specific product of bourgeois society and only occurs in texts with the final overthrow of bourgeois social relations. It only occurs in texts with its current meaning with the final overthrow of bourgeois social relations. It means something quite different in an earlier period. The origin of the word is... Um, a person owing obedience from the French sujet, from Latin subjectus, which means brought under, from thr or thrown under, thrown under or brought under the authority of someone. If you look through Google Books, the first occurrence in print of the term subject is in the calendar of patent rolls preserved in the 
Public Records Office and is an entry for the 6th of July 1579 where it says that John Squeen, alias Shoes, born a subject of the Duke of Cleves, paid in six shillings and eightpence to the patent rolls. It's a recording of a payment to the state by a subject of the Duke of Cleves. Similarly in French, uh, Le Capitaine Salvador Aguerre, Capitaine Paul Lady Marquis François de la Place Forte et Château de Vrezieux, lui remonstré qui est en né sujet du roi, et mis à la garde de celle place par Lady Marquis François et, étant sujet et serviteur. And that's from 1571. Similarly, what, what it's talking about here is a, a relation of personal dependence and servitude. So the concept of subject in bourgeois, in feudal ideology, is a person who is subject to a sovereign. The polarity is not subject and object, as you get in 19th century philosophy. It's the sovereign and his subjects. The opposite of a subject is not an object, it's the sovereign. Now this is a basic social relation of feudalism. Feudal social relations are based on personal subordination. A person is only conceived, both biologically and metaphorically, in relations of subordination and domination. So in that previous text, it's saying the guy was born a subject of the king. Their status as a subject is there from birth. If we look in the 1700s, when feudal social relations were beginning to, to weaken, but you still had monarchy, you still had princes, you still had the aristocracy, what does the word subject mean? And we're taking the Royal Dictionary of English and French and French to English, Volume 2, 1752. It says, a subject means tied, obliged to any dependence, one that is under the dominance of a sovereign prince. It notes that in French it was equivalent to the people of a state and gives an example. It's impossible to raise great taxes without grieving the subject. It says, translates as, il est impossible de lever des gros impôts sans fouler le peuple. Now, note that transition there. In English usage, the subject, a singular noun, means all the people subject to the king. And it can be translated into French simply as the people. So since all people were subjects, the term subject starts to refer to people in general. There's a slide from the specific subjection by the state just translating as the term as equivalent to the people. In 19th century French and English you continue to use the word in the senses of subject of the king, subject matter, subject of a sentence, but you don't get it used in the philosophical sense that uh, Marxist philosophy and German idealist philosophy uses it. In German it starts to be used in, in its specific bourgeois sense in the early 19th century. The earliest example I can find using Google searching is in the Lehrbuch der Nat Naturlichten Rechtwissenschaft of 1803 and that's the earliest use of the term Rechtssubjekt in Google Books. Now why is that important? It's because it's through German philosophy that the concept of subject in its bourgeois sense enters into philosophical discourse. So, what's the modern capitalist terminology for these ideas? English law doesn't use the term subject, or very rarely uses the term subject. It uses the term legal person. French may use the term sujet juridique for the same thing. And in German, uh, abstract legal theory would have be recht subject. And English translations of German text, including translations of, uh, including Marxist works, okay, including works of Marxist legal theory, 
may use the term legal subject or subject of right because they're, they're translating from German texts whereas the actual equivalent English usage is legal person. But all these refer to the same thing. They refer to the abstract property owner, abstract buyer and seller of commodities. Now, what's the relationship between value, commodity production and legal subjects? The point is that commodity production makes all concrete labours appear in the abstract form of exchange value. And a commodity producing society gives all buyers and sellers the abstract form of legal persons or subjects of right. But you mustn't assume that these legal categories are the same as human beings. Importantly, companies are legal persons and collections of people like a club are, can also be legal persons. Beyond that, not all human beings are legal persons. You, this is clear even in 19th century Anglo-Saxon law texts where I'm taking the science of law from 1877. A human being or aggregate body of human beings is in this exact and limited sense of the expression a legal person. A term like other legal terms on some sides covers more and some sides less than the popular world. Not all human beings are legal persons. Under a condition of absolute slavery the unhappy human beings who are serves, slaves are not persons in this legal sense. This is a US textbook written shortly after the abolition of slavery so the the, the situation of human beings who weren't persons was very familiar to any American lawyer. Now why is the legal person like this? Why is the Ford Motor Company a legal person? It's a legal person because it buys and sells. An individual capitalist likewise uh, are in Marx's terms personifications of capital. But a slave who couldn't buy and sell, but was bought and sold, couldn't be a subject of right. They were an object of property, mutually exclusive legal categories. So, as a summary, legal categories reflect production relations. Generalised commodity production creates the abstract category of legal persons. All such persons are formally equal into the law, able, enter, able to enter into contract, etc., though in practice this equal right is a right to inequality because of the very different wealth of the people entering into these relations. Bourgeois philosophy mystifies this. It takes the elementary legal form under which the capitalist is personified and turns this into a reified abstraction, apparently divorced from the real economic relations that historically created it. So what are the implications of this that we should pay attention to now? The first point is that subjects have a purely formal legal existence. They have no causal effect. You cannot give a material explanation of human behaviour if your explanation depends on there being a subject inside the human body. Legal categories like subject exist only at the level of property relations and their projection onto the working of the human brain is entirely ideological and unscientific. Brains are biological systems. They are not bourgeois legal categories. Now, I think it's necessary to criticise the latent idealism which even some quite militant Marxist philosophers still carry over here. Uh, Althusser, for example, has made many useful contributions to defending Marxist ideas. But his theory of ideology is ambiguous. He's purporting to provide a materialist theory of the subject. But his theory is still conceding to idealism in that he partially accepts that subjects really exist and that they have a causal effect in explaining the psychology of human behaviour. He fails to take 
the historical materialist approach that such philosophical categories are just the ideological reflection of relations of production. I hope to come back to this in another talk where I will be further criticising the Althusserian theory of ideology but defending what Althusser says about Lenin and philosophy.